this is all about scale up. Um, and in, I, I think there were some elements or some questions in that last one around exactly how do you do tech transfer, how do you scale up? Um, and so I think we'll have time for that. So without further ado, uh, we have Evan Shave, um, who's coming, yep, um, who's the Global Tech Transfer Manager, Lead, Director. Uh, all above. He can all above. He, he's, uh, yeah. he's the person you need to talk to when it comes to uh, tech transfer at uh, Pathio on both Thermo Fisher. So Evan, please. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah, so Thermo Fisher, the, the drug substance manufacturing network is shown here on this slide. Uh, we have sites in uh, the US, St. Louis, uh, Princeton, uh, Groningen, Netherlands, Langnau, Switzerland, Hangzhou, China, and Brisbane. So the site in Brisbane is over in the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Right behind that, we have a, um, a drug substance manufacturing facility. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm based here in, in town, but um, my group is uh, spread out around the world. So I have engineers at each of the sites. And uh, in, the, in the role of Global MSAT, we run all the tech transfers and um, very much involved in best practices around manufacturing and standardization at all our sites. Um, so you can see most of our facilities um, see the production, clinical production scale. Um, is it working? Yep, there it goes. Yeah, it's around uh, 2,000 2, 2, litre and all the way up to 12,000 litres in, 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 in um, Switzerland, Langnau. Um, but I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about, about the scale up, scale up later on. So one of the questions we get asked a lot, both internally and by our customers, is uh, how much product do you need? Um, how much product, what's the right production scale for, for my, my, my product, my, my process? And so there's a, there's a graph here on the left which shows the annual demand for commercial monoclonal antibody class uh, uh, drugs. Um, there's two, two bars, one's 2021 and then looking out to 2025. And you'll see the, on the x-axis it's divided into um, greater than 400 kilos per year and then the middle is 100 to 400 kilos per year and then less than 100 kilos per year. And you can see the trend we're trying to show here is that um, looking out to 2025, we expect to see an increase in this mid-range uh, 100 to 400 kilos per year. And, and that, that's, been, that's an important, um, because it's, 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 it's driving decisions that we, we're making around what technology to invest in, in terms of uh, bioreactor scale. Um, and then in the, the, the lowest sort of um, size, the 1 to 100 kilos per year, uh, it's higher at the moment, but we're predict predicting that to drop off a, a bit uh, over the next th three years or so. And so then the, and the other um, part of this slide is just looking at what's happened to titers over the years. And, um, you know, the prediction that the titers are continu continuing to head up in the, in the um, cell culture towards 5 to 10 grams per litre. We're essentially already here with any commercial... Any, any, modern, any modern process being developed now is, is coming in that range of 5 to 10 grams per litre. Um, and the advancements that have created that are around cell line development advances and, and improvements in, um, in media optimization. So with that in mind, uh, Thermo Fisher has, has really focused, been focusing on um, bioreactors in this up to 2,000 litre scale um, for, 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 for cl clinical and commercial uh, antibodies, but if, if, if we're predicting that, that towards 400 kilos per year, we actually need something even bigger. And so um, recently, that Thermo Fisher has released the, the next size up in the single-use bioreactor, which is a 5,000 litre bioreactor. It's known as the Dyna Drive. Um, and you can see that uh, you know, the, the type of product, now of product coming through here ranges between 10 kilos and 40 kilos per batch, depending on the titer. And so if we're looking at 400 kilos per year, then this is the right size bioreactor where you need to be running you know, 10 to 15 batches a year to supply the market. That's the reason Thermo Fish has invested in a 5,000 litre bioreactor rather than staying at 2,000 litre or rather than jumping up to 10,000, 20,000 litre stainless steel. And, and this, this has been an internally developed technology. We have a, a, an equipment group, a bioprocess, <laughs> bioprocess group, who've, who've um, been working on this for many years, and it's, it's, this is now on the market. But some of the features of this uh, new bioreactor shown here with um, the bag itself is collapsible. You can, you can fold the whole thing up for easy uh, transport. The, the mixing shaft is actually a, it's like a rope ladder, so it's no longer a rigid shaft that has to be installed. It comes already installed in the bag, 
And then, um, and then there's been a lot of work done around ca characterizing the mixing, the mixing performance of this, and, and really the, the, the cuboid shape and the uh, impeller design and location have, has resulted in extremely um, uh, you know, high performance mixing um, while, while, while delivering low shear mixing. So it's great that we can run at 5,000 litre scale, but then the question is what happens about scaling that down again? Because we can't, we can't run process development at 5,000 litre scale. And so we need to look back down our scale, scalable um, train and see and, and, and show that we can uh, model a process at bench scale and then know confidently we can run that at 5,000 litre scale when the process is ready. And so we've, we've, over the last six or 12 months, we've been generating this information going as low as 250 mils using the, uh, a system like Sartorius Amber 250, uh, where we can um, generate uh, many runs at small scale, uh, representative runs, and then scale up at each step all the way up towards 5,000 litre. I've got a s scattering of uh, data here showing that scale up performance in terms of tighter, viable cell density, VCD, and also CO2 inside the each scale bioreactor. And essentially the take home message is that at each step up, the, the performance is similar, or, or we're able to um, interpret the findings to allow that to, 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 um, to design the next step, scale up. Okay, and lastly, um, some applications of this new single use technology. So uh, really this is looking to the future. We're not, we're not doing all these things yet, but the, the top picture here shows us a traditional uh, 2000 liter cell culture seed train where you have multiple steps going from flask, uh, file to, vial to flask to wave bags, rockers into the bioreactors, and then you do depth filter harvest. In the, our, our view of the future would be look, using technology such as high density cell banks to skip these flask steps to go from vial straight into rocker bag, and then utilizing some of the features of these new bioreactors, which have very high turndown ratios, so we can operate them at low volume and then top it up rather than transferring to multiple different vessels. That's what I mean by high turn, high turn down ratio. That, that'll, that, you, can, you can see that just from this picture that going from the top to the bottom, there's, there's a lot less equipment. So you're using less, less uh, footprint in your facility. You're, uh, you've got less interactions with transferring between reactors, so less risk of, of contamination, um, reduced labor, reduced uh, um, bags, uh, plastic parts. And then on the, on, the, on the final back end here, when you want to harvest uh, a 5,000 litre bioreactor, you could throw a whole bunch of uh, depth filter membrane area at it. Or uh, another new technology we've just uh, released, which is called the DynaSpin single-use centrifuge, uh, can be used to uh, clarify a volume such as 5,000 litres and then significantly cut down on how much depth filter you need at the back end. So these are, I guess, just a quick snapshot of all the different single-use technologies we're looking at, both small and large scale, and applying it to uh, this challenge of uh, constantly scaling up but doing it uh, uh, you know, cheaper, faster, and uh, in a more streamlined way. Thanks. Amgad Toma is the production supervisor at QGen, so another um, GMP um, CDMO that we have in town in Brisbane. Um, is, is QGen based over at um, QIMR, um, Bergerhofer. And Amjad, Amgad, you already have experience in both uh, microbial at Luina, now at CuraBio, and so it'll be great to get your insights. Let me just quickly get your Thanks, slides ready. But I'll let you tell the story of what you're going to grace us with today. So I've spent 12 years of my life working in bioprocessing, um, upstream and downstream. I worked in commercial manufacturing of biosimilars, and then I moved to um, Acura Bio and worked in, um, uh, as a CDMO. Um, and then finally, my journey ended in QGen two years ago, um, working in the cell and gene therapy space. So I thought it would be uh, nice today to highlight the differences between uh, the scale-up options and parameters, what we are looking at when we scale up uh, in cell and gene therapy and how is that different uh, compared to uh, traditional bioprocessing. So this is a typical workflow uh, of uh, a cell and gene therapy process. It always uh, starts, sorry, just getting used to it. Yep. So it always starts with the patient. 
uh, blood collection happens in the clinical site, and then this blood uh, gets transported under controlled conditions to the manufacturer, uh, where you can uh, just activate it with some peptides or uh, use a vector to transduce uh, your cells, um, and then expand them. Uh, of course, wash, formulate them, and then uh, they go back to the clinical site uh, for the patient. So this is a typical workflow for an autologous uh, manufacturing process. And, and this is to highlight the differences between uh, the challenges that we see in cell and gene therapy compared to regular or tradi more traditional uh, biopharmaceutical manufacturing, uh, where you can see that in traditional biologics, one batch provides numerous doses. So if you want to treat more people or if you want to move to commercial manufacturing, you just increase your scale. Uh, in autologous ATMPs, one batch provides only for one patient. Is it? Can you hear me? So one batch per patient. Um, the starting material is characterized, cell bank, uh, in traditional manufacturing, yeah, this way. Yeah. So the starting material is always a well-characterized cell bank uh, in traditional manufacturing, where in cell and gene therapy, uh, your starting material is variable, it's different, it's patient's own blood, uh, not perfectly healthy, different from patient to another patient. Uh, production is made to stock, so you can uh, estimate your needs. You need 400 kilograms per year, for example, of your drug substance. So you're going to manufacture 10 batches at that scale. Uh, uh, in autologous manufacturing, uh, production is on demand um, and for targeted use. So if you want to treat, like one interesting uh, statistic is uh, for the currently approved cell therapies, uh, 60,000 people are eligible for treatment but only in 2018 and 2019, 1,700 of those people got treated and the rest are on uh, waiting lists. So this shows us how um, uh, um, uh, scaling up is really challenging. Uh, the facility uh, outlay in uh, traditional uh, biopharmaceutical manufacturing, you, you will have an upstream suite and then you move in your unidirectional flow uh, to cleaner downstream suites where you do your purification and then progress to final filtration and fill. Um, in autologous, because you need to uh, manufacture multiple parallel batches, uh, they call it scaling out rather than scaling up. <clears throat> so you have a modular design which is uh, standard and repetitive clean rooms, uh, all basically constructed in the same way and have the same equipment to allow you to parallel uh, uh, manufacture multiple doses. Um, higher dose numbers are achieved by scale up, while higher dose numbers are achieved by scaling out and parallelization. Um, monitored logistics and transport are planned and implemented for large batches, whereas in cell and gene therapy, uh, you have to maintain a chain of custody and trace back all the materials and all the starting material and the final product back uh, to uh, an individual dose to an individual patient. And you have to ship every individual dose separately because uh, 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 of the short shelf life, complex storage and transport conditions in liquid nitrogen. So the objectives for optimization and process improvement um, uh, are a little bit different, where you are trying to standardize and characterize your starting material to address donor and patient variability. So this is one of the challenges. Your starting material is variable. Um, you're trying to ease bottlenecks to, uh, to uh, meet the increased demand and reduce the patient dropout rate. You, need, you want to treat as many patients as you can, uh, so you want to ease all your bottlenecks. And you need to manage your complex logistics uh, and to aid regulatory compliance. So I'll, I'll speak quickly uh, about the standardization of starting material. So starting material is usually a patient's own blood. Uh, uh, it usually gets isolated. Uh, uh, we isolate the mononuclear cells uh, with a density gradient. And then you can uh, uh, do more standardization by enrich enriching the target cells with some techniques like flow cytometry and magnetic-based cell sorting. So that standardization, you isolate a specific subtype of uh, cells. For example, in T cell, in CAR T cell therapy, you isolate your T cells, a specific phenotype, uh, 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 and start expanding this specific phenotype. So that's how you standardly remove all uh, uh, other cells that you are not working on. Uh, this increases robustness and improves uh, or standardizes the growth kinetics. Easing bottlenecks. Um, the second target when you are scaling out and, uh, and optimizing. Uh, 
you try to work with starting materials that are more uh, uh, allows you more flexibility to manage patients and and the facility. For example, you can work with frozen uh, leukopax, so a leukapheresis process can uh, be done in the clinical site if they have the capacity to do so. Uh, uh, this can be frozen and stored, and it then allows you to start manufacturing as soon as a manufacturing spot is available, which is not the case with uh, blood. For example, if you're going to start with patient blood, that blood has to be transported and processed in the manufacturing facility within 48 hours. So if you're treating a large number of patients, uh, you will have a lot of bottlenecks. You have to m make sure that you have trained people uh, and rooms and manufacturing slots available. For example, if you're treating 50 patients and the patient has to be scheduled to exactly uh, uh, um, uh, um, be uh, the blood be collected at the time the room is going to be available. So if we move to cryopreserved uh, PBMCs obtained by the by leukopheresis at the clinical sites, and that would facilitate managing patients and managing the facility. Um, some of the future directions we're looking into at QGen is moving to automated PBMC isolation, so that will uh, decrease the footprint uh, 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 and ease this bottleneck where you can collect uh, blood at the clinical site if they don't have the capacity to um, do uh, an aphoresis process. Can collect the blood, then it can be processed much easier in much shorter time without having to do any environmental monitoring because all of these products have to be manufactured via aseptic technique. So you can't work in grade C or D, you have to, everything has to be done aseptically. You don't have the luxury of doing a sterile filtration step at the end because that will take out all your cells and your probe. Uh, so if we use automation, single use equipment, that will decrease the turnaround time and uh, reduce the environmental monitoring and all the sterile uh, aseptic work around it. And then you can freeze it and store it. Once a manufacturing slot is available, you can start your um, transduction and expansion steps. Uh, modular facility design is one of the uh, ways we uh, handle that need for complex scale out. Uh, we have multiple repetitive uh, standardized clean rooms. Um, and looking into some um, uh, improvements in, uh, in the assays, for example, used for releasing the product, because again, uh, the patient outcome is uh, directly affected by your uh, batch manufacturing. So there is a patient sick. At probably uh, 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 probably deteriorating and is going to try an investigation of therapy. So you need to release that product as quickly as possible. For example, using uh, quantitative PCR uh, instead of standard pharmacopoeial testing and mycoplasma methods to increase um, the speed of product release. Another solution is um, moving to allogenic cell therapies, which is creating cell banks so instead of using patient's blood, you get blood from healthy uh, donors based on their uh, human leukocyte antigen. Um, you process that blood, and then you create uh, cell banks from different uh, uh, donors' blood. Um, and based on the HLA, um, you will treat your patient. That kind of standardizes the process and creates an off-the-shelf, affordable, more affordable and more quick and readily available and standardized therapy. Uh, logistics in cell therapy are much more complicated than traditional bioprocessing. Uh, so you have to uh, uh, work with vendors because lots of the media components are not uh, standardized. Uh, lots of them are not uh, produced in GMP uh, qualified facilities. You will have to sometimes use uh, 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 materials from animal or human origin. So that adds a lot of complication to um, uh, getting your, um, your product um, past the regulators, of course. Uh, so you have to uh, do media screenings and optimizations to try and eliminate animal-derived materials and try and aim to use serum-free media, if that's possible. Uh, help your vendors um, uh, uh, to achieve GMP standards and qualify them. Try to establish partnerships to ensure long-term supply of critical raw materials. Lots of those critical raw materials are complicated to um, uh, manufacture and um, you, you want to, to maintain this supply chain throughout the whole uh, manufacturing life of your product. And uh, even blood collection needs to be uh, controlled at clinical sites. So usually you would go to the clinical sites and um, train them and establish procedures to uh, uh, collect the blood, identify it properly, and maintain that chain of custody and validate the transport and the transport of the final product as well.
Thanks. All right, I am going to jump in here and just share a few thoughts because um, single use is something that uh, I believe all, all of the speakers are, are covering today. And, uh, and, and in, in, in biomanufacturing, uh, unless you're at the 12, 12,500 litre scale, that is a stainless steel bioreactor. But what you'll see is it's powered and enabled by a lot of single use sampling, um, tubing connections, and so forth. So single use is, um, is, is great. It's both your best friend and also your most uh, challenging friend. So this is an interesting one. I was at an ISP conference and I asked for um, this gentleman's slides. But this is often how they're marketed, but then the reality of what it actually looks like, um, there's a lot. There's a lot of tubing. So even, even a standard chromatography system, you know, we, we are talking about a, a lot of tubing that has to connect. And if your buffers are not immediately next to where the production is and then they have to travel out um, to where those totes are, and then in GMP, you really don't want to have things on the floor. So you, you create you know, these... Um, contraptions that are able to keep the tubing off the floor and there are different ways of doing this. Um, so single use brings a level of complexity but it can really also speed things up. Um, one other thing to consider when you're scaling up with single use is you know choosing the right tube set, the, the right tube diameter. Um, so just looking at this column on the left hand side, this is in inches, hopefully you can work that out or you're familiar with this, but it's basically talking about the inner diameter and it has an impact. So if you identify the wrong tubing set on how you're going to either add cells to your bioreactor or transfer buffer through a wall or feed a chromatography system, if there are limitations and you don't have the right size um, diameter, you get hit with the flow rate and exactly how fast you can transfer things. And so for some cases, um, it's absolutely fine. But you know, if, you, if you're trying to pump 100 liters, um, from one vessel to another and you've got a small bore tubing, you could be sitting there for an hour. And if that's not what you've designed into your process, then you're going to have to stop and you have to turn around. So there's that. And there's also the weight. So this is taking out, you know, a 30 meter length of that tubing. But as you can sort of see, you get... In, in, there's not many single-use systems that really go much above one inch. Um, but the tubing size, because it gets larger, it needs to be self-supporting. It brings in a level of... Um, reinforcement, and it adds a lot of weight. So you start to have you know, 10, 30 kilos of weight worth of tubing. So these tubing sets are hard to handle. They have to be you know, irradiated. They have to be transported to site. They have to be set up. They have to be checked. So there are, there are considerations. You know, single use does, it, it is something you have to really balance out and make, it, make sure you're working out what works well. Um, they're, 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 they're really popular because they enable rapid changeover. You don't need CIP and SIP, um, but when, when they do fail, um, you know, there are some common ones to look out for. So, uh, you know, th these are different examples. And that weight one here, this is a perfect example. This is a bioreactor bag that was transferred in um, probably like a best-in-class, you know, as, as um, Evan was saying, what's important with the, with the bioreactors are these um, agitators. So that's a hard point inside of a bag. And when you're sticking that um, and shipping it around the world, um, those bags, the, the, the plastic, um, can connect. So in this case, you know, this is where the hard edge of an agitator poked a hole in the bag. Um, the bag is for a bioreactor. If it's not sterile, it has a hole in it, it's obviously not going to work. And in this, this was a case where large, you know, one-inch tubing ports were added. Um, but because of that weight um, and transporting in the way they were, they... Uh, they that backwards and forwards over the case of um, you know, transferring from the other side of the world ended up having a crease and a, and a failure point. Um, this is a TFF membrane um, that was being used for a, a concentration fed batch. Um, but, you know, so we were looking to retain the cells and what we started to see was cells ending up in the permeate. And it wasn't immediately obvious um, but then when in, in looking at the failure point, it, it was the potting system that it, so these are small, like half or one millimeter diameter lumen um, hollow fiber filters. So this crack is not particularly obvious to see and you might have missed it. Um, I don't think it was caught up. You know, there are different ways you can do pre-use testing to try and identify if you've lost um, the, the integrity of a system. But these, these systems can and do fail. And this was another one where um, 
it was a new type of uh, tubing port um, and it was actually, and this is the value of actually working with, with the suppliers because a lot of times you're on the bleeding edge, you're actually trying things for the first time, they haven't been put in this way in this situation um, and there was a, there was a design fault. Um, it looked great, worked great, but we were seeing a whole bunch of failures um, in how that HDPE had been extruded and then incorporated into the bag and these you know, with a light source behind it, it's very easy to see it, but when you're just looking at a bag, you go to use it and then you get a leak and then you've got to try and understand where did that leak come from. Uh, and this final one is, you know, up in the crease uh, of a bioreactor. So again, just when it's inflated and filled with air and it's sort of shifting and moving a little bit with, over time, um, you know, these, these high tension points um, can, can lead to a failure of the film um, and that leads to, um, a bad situation. So I, I guess it's, um, it's really good to have a strategy for when you're moving to larger volumes or, or any sort of scale up, but specifically around single use. You know, if you've always worked with a small um, 10 litre bag or whatever it is, when you suddenly move to a 200 or a 2000, um, you've got to be really careful. A, because of the amount of money that's going into that setup um, in terms of the media and the production slot and all the people involved. Um, but you start to really take great notes. So we put these bags inside of totes or a single-use bioreactor shell or whatever it is, but the best practice is to get in there and wipe it down beforehand to make sure there's no particulates that might um, you know, uh, contact that surface and lead to something over the course of a 14-day bioreactor run. Um, it's good to very carefully open the bag, you know, ideally without scissors, um, and bags come in multiple bags, so you've got to really look at that whole um, process of how you bring them into the suite, get it out flat, put it down on, you know, if you've got a two meter, you need to have a very large table or operation area that you can have a look at that bag and, and surgically inspect all the lines. Any tie wrap that is, you know, has come off is a potential failure point. Um, and, and feedback, you, you need to, in real time, be able to give this information back, work with the vendors, because they'd like to know about it um, because these bags are everywhere and or these devices are out there and the, and the sooner that someone is identifying this, they can start to do the investigation and work out, did it happen here, did it happen there, is it uh, which end and what's contributing to it. Um, and I'll just finish with sort of a few failures that have sort of come along the way. It's good to sort of share these so people are aware of them. So this one was a, a media bag. Um, it looked fine, you know, passed through sort of inspection, but when we went to use it, we, inside the drum, we started to see a little bit of liquid. Turns out there was a tiny little hole there, um, and that was, you know, basically new in a drum, and so we, we, we couldn't really say that it was on our end, and uh, the supplier did the root cause and worked out that when they were doing the aseptic fill, there was a um, stainless steel tri-clamp that's used to hold it in place when that wasn't being used. It was just hung over the side of the drum, and that being there with the bag being next to it was enough to um, ha lead to that. So they have a corrective action to change that process. Um, some of the initial aseptic connectors that we used, uh, if you didn't use the right sort of tri-clamp, it came with a plastic one, but if you used a metal one, it was bad news, it could lead to leaking. Uh, also with these, sometimes they come irradiated and that's fine, and then in-house you might be autoclaving something but those can lead to different scenarios on that plastic and how they react to the ethylene oxide or to the... Um, and so, again, just slight tolerances that change, it can lead to you know, a situation where those end up leaking. Um, in one case, you know, the line here, this was a, an error on, on our side in terms of it wasn't appropriately clamped, and so the sodium hydroxide solution was able to get down the line and contact the single-use um, connector, and if you're familiar with these, they have a, plast they have a paper um, sort of membrane that goes over the top that keeps it sterile, and then when you connect them together, you pull that out of the way. But in this case, because it had made it its way, to that sodium hydroxide had made it in, it had passed past it, and it had started to inter interfere with the plastic and made it brittle, so we went to go use it, just snapped. Um, this was a bioreactor bag. Here's a best practice. Do a water hole test. You know, do a, you can well, probably not a water hold on a process, but there's certain times that it makes sense to do a pressure hold test, definitely, but other times it's good to put the media in and see that that holds before you add the cells. Um, but in this case, you know, we had a failure, and so we pulled it about, and, you know, and you, when you start to then in, 
you know, again, go in and look for these problems, you start to see a whole bunch of different, is it this one, is it this one, is it this one? And as it turns out, this was the one that leaked. You know, it was just a, it was just a pin leak, but you know, it, it, it's not going to lead to a favorable outcome. And the last one here is just, it's not a great photo, but it's a tiny little nick that led to, to a leak. This was in a 20 litre product bag, so that's the wrong part of the process to have a leak. That's when you've got the million dollar batch sitting there and you don't really want to have any mistakes. Um, but in this one, when, when we did the due diligence and investigated and pulled all the other bags that were affected or maybe affected from that lot, what we noticed is that this cut was showing up in multiple locations. And if you folded the bag back into its original orientation, you could see that the nick had gone through multiple. And so our, our recourse was probably that when it was being opened in, um, in the warehouse with a box cutter, it might have just gone through the, through the box and, and clipped um, the bag. So it's really careful to try and look at the, the complete process of where the material comes on site, that whole receipt, um, and all the different people that can contribute um, all the way to that end. So just a, a few sort of things that can, can go wrong when using single use and scaling up. So that was it. <laughs>
and they become startled. So the approach we've taken is a slowly, slowly approach. We'll give them something that they can, they can work with. The other uh, you know, viral filtration, ultrafiltration is something that we use anyway, and people are quite happy with it. I, I think that the moot point here is that when you deal with regulators, you've got to be a little bit more tactful than you'd like to be. All right, so hemofrag, four processes, cone, I say 10 because you know, that's uh, sometimes in the literature, but uh, greater than uh, 10 processes. And the process yields, ours, we have process yields of about 90%. We're talking about process yields of 50% or less, depending on the protein that you, you look at with cone fractionation. So what is this bioseparation process? Three membranes. So you've got a restriction membrane, you've got a separation membrane, and you've got another restriction membrane. So three membranes, and it's put between uh, uh, two electrodes. And it's only when you have the electromotive force across, across those membranes that you get a separation. Now, think about this. There are 3,000 proteins in plasma. And provided you get your right buffer, the right charges on those particular proteins, you can pull out one, and I say this again, one protein with very high purity and very high yield. So you can separate these proteins by size and or charge. So you, you have that ability to use both of those characteristics, and you've got the ability to make sure that you move um, uh, proteins across that membrane. These membranes are only manufactured at our facility in um, Macquarie Park, and they are polyacrylamide-based membranes. So g let me give you an, a, a quick example of what we do. So we've got three membranes. And if you wanted to look at a soup of uh, proteins, you charge those proteins up. And that's easy. You, you get a buffer. Uh, the, the closer to the isoelectric point uh, on either side, you can either charge them positive or negatively. When you then put the electromotive force across, you get a separation. And it's as simple as that, and it's as complex as that. If you did the same thing now, with size separation, so you bring in uh, molecules of different size, they can all be equally charged. Right? But the separation membrane, that's this thing over here, th this can be a membrane that's wound up to or down to any pore size that you want. And then when you put the electromotive force across the membrane, you get the, the separation based on size. So what are the challenges here? And I, I get asked this question because I, I, I hear from certain experts who have not used this technology. It seems this technology can't be scaled up. The, uh, the truth of the matter is if you walk into our Macquarie facility, you will actually see a whole fractionation plant there with this big piece of equipment scaled up. So I'm not exactly sure how else you can show people this thing can be scaled up. Challenges we have or had was that you have to make sure that the same membrane materials and method of production of membranes, so bench scale to large scale, they are the same. The increase the total membrane surface area through increasing the number of membranes with each cartridge. All right? We had to look at the increase in the number of cartridges. So in other words, the more cartridges that you use, the, the higher the scale. And then we had to look at the maintenance of the ratio of plasma to the total surface area of the membrane. So more plasma or more proteins exposed to the membrane, the more you get in terms of separation. And then we had to look at the maintenance of residence time of the circulating plasma in the actual process system followed by the maintenance of the strength of the electromotive force and then any cooling requirements that we have. So we've spent a fair bit of time, and I, I, I kid you not, it has been 37 years, uh, that we've actually worked on this technology. And there are lots of uh, peer-reviewed publications that actually back all this up. But when, you, when you're looking at that, you can go from a laboratory-based system, which is a very cute little system. So you can you know, go down to about 10 uh, mils, even less, and then go up to the next level of a scale up to what we have here at the moment. And you can see here, these are cartridges. I'm actually quite, uh, I was actually quite intrigued when Ben said that, you know, what you have in a chromatography system with all the, the, the tubing. I'll tell you what, uh, I, I know that from my experience with the TGA, if we had that many bits of tubing, uh, I would have a long time to explain why <laughs> those tubings were on the floor. So uh, for us, it is vital that we had all the tubings and everything else concealed in the actual framework, especially because we're dealing with plasma. Now, so here comes the challenge. You have a cartridge. That cartridge 
is actually made up of these membranes, as I, as I showed you. Whoops, I'm going to do the same thing here. OK, so you've got a retaining clip, and you've got all those membranes. Now, in that cartridge, you can actually increase the number of layers of those membranes. That's your scale up number one. And then the next thing is the actual surface area of the membrane. Now, my friend Carl at the back there, who's our communications manager, actually said that the best way to describe this, and I actually think he's right, is by looking at a, a solar panel. So you get one solar panel, one gigawatt, right? You get a second uh, and a series of solar panels, you get your uh, 10 megabytes to whatever uh, a gigabyte uh, configuration that you're, that you're looking at. And very similarly, you can have a solar farm, right? Very similar sort of situation with us. One cartridge, you have various membranes in there, layers of membranes, that's your scale up. The next element of this is the number of cartridges that you have within the system. The, the unique advantage that we have is we've spent a lot of time perfecting that particular cartridge. So for us, when you're looking at scale up, the only issues that you've got to look at is how engineering wise you connect up those cartridges and the flows within those cartridges. And that allows us uh, scale up in a very, very unique uh, manner. And that's what you see here. So in our Macquarie facility, we have, or will have actually these eight cartridge systems which will take care of about 100,000 liters of plasma per year. In our Springfield uh, facility, you're looking at 10 times that. But they're all based on the replication of those cartridges and nothing else. This is a, a, a Queensland government supported uh, project. But the thing that I wanted to get across to you is the uniqueness of the technology and the problems associated with the scale-up, which are quite different, and I repeat, quite different from anything else that you've, you've heard here today. And scale-up uh, uh, from us, really, the, the challenge initially was the cartridge. And that cartridge is uniquely manufactured by us in Macquarie Park. And that means that we've actually overcome any issues with scale-up going from a small uh, device to a major plant. Thank you.